the UN's men's national team is gonna win the 2026 World Cup. Do you think I sound crazy? Well, the US's new manager, Mauricio Pochettino, does not think so. What success for the United States at the World Cup? Win. Win the World Cup. So for those who might have missed it, Pochettino was recently announced as the US's new man in charge following the second sacking of Greg Berhalter. This appointment holds a lot of weight since it seemingly came out of nowhere, yet to an extent it really makes sense. Pochettino is a manager who has a ton of managerial experience at club level from multiple top European sides and also Tottenham. His forward style of play and his tactical prowess is at a level that the US men's national team hasn't really seen or haven't been close to since the departure of Jurgen Klinsmann, which is something that the country is in desperate need of from a footballing perspective. On the other end of the deal you have the national team, who realistically under Pochettino have the potential to really start making strides and becoming a bigger force on the world stage of international football, in large part due to the mass exodus of American players who find themselves established in European sides. Even if you don't want to give credit to the French players that don't really get too many minutes in Europe, it's impossible to ignore the fact that the US men's national team has players like Pulisic who has become a vital part of AC Milan setup, Balogun who plays a key part from Monaco, and who was also formerly an Englishman, Anthony Robinson, who was easily one of the best left backs in the Premier League, and they also have players like Gio Reyna, Musa, Richards, and Tyler Adams, who are key squad players. So Pochettino, this player who has tons of experience, is coming into this national team setup with a lot of things to work with. So with all this in mind, it really begs the question, how far can Pochettino really take the US men's national team? And real quick boys, if you're new to the channel, don't forget to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. We're dropping weekly football videos, so make sure you hit that notification bell don't miss an upload and if you're not new to the channel boys welcome back glad to have you around for another video with that being said boys let's take a look into the u.s men's national team and pochettino and see what might come of this relationship and i think before exactly going into what pochettino may or may not do with the u.s it's also important more or less to talk about how the u.s got into their current situation and also a couple of the major hurdles that they faced over these last couple of years and when it comes to the l taken by the u.s men's national team it doesn't get much bigger than when they failed to make the 2018 world World Cup. As all you guys know, the World Cup gives all the best countries in the world the opportunity to go at it. The best nations from the respective confederations all finally have the chance to show billions of people what they're capable of. And the United States, world power, colonial threat, one of the two biggest teams in its respective region, failed to qualify for the 2018 World Cup, which was their first World Cup miss since 1986. So during the qualification process for this tournament, the United States found themselves in the hex, which is the final stages of the CONCACAF World Cup qualification process. This sees the six best teams in the confederation going at it to see who's going to qualify for the World Cup. The top three teams qualify and then the fourth place team gets placed into an intercontinental knockout match usually against a team in Asia. So all eyes as usual on the US and on Mexico to see what they were going to be able to do and of course we're talking about the US today. So the first two matches for the US saw them lose on home turf against Mexico and then travel to Costa Rica to get pounded out 4-0 by Los Ticos. After an abysmal start then manager Jurgen Klinsmann would be sacked by the national team and replaced with Bruce Arenas. And if you ask me, this is probably when US fans knew they were cooked. From here, the US would go on to win three, draw three, and lose two of the remaining eight matches, which would seal their fate as the fifth place team, thus missing out on the World Cup. So we don't have the capacity. <laughs> The most embarrassing aspect of their failure to qualify was the fact that on the final match day, the US found themselves in third place, and they had to go up against Trinidad and Tobago, who had only managed one win and nine losses to that point in time, sitting very comfortably in last place. Before the match, Bruce Arena would complain about the pitch conditions, which made as much sense as Ty from AFTV complaining about the rain. Happened. Remember, we mustn't forget that it's been raining, so... The pitch is quite... It's been raining! The US had one job, and it was to beat a squad that was significantly inferior to them. I'm talking about this is Real Madrid going to play against Plymouth Argyle for a chance to qualify for the Champions League. And if they get the job done, the US can leave the poor performances behind and focus on the World Cup that's ahead of them, essentially turning a new league. Well, instead, the US would lose 2-1 to Trinidad and would seal their fate for good. And again, given the stature of the US, them missing out on the World Cup was a massive 
setback for the growth of football culture. You had this country that had been parading the growth of MLS for the last handful of years, failed to qualify for a World Cup. That was such a bad look for the US. Arena would resign shortly after this match, and at that point, the US Soccer Federation was pretty much forced to go back to the drawing board. And following Arena, the US would appoint Greg Berhalter, and he would commence his first reign of terror in 2018. See, Berhalter was a manager who had spent his entire coaching career at MLS to that point in time. So it was still yet to see what he was going to be able to offer this nation that was in desperate need of an actual turnaround. Having kept their hiring process pretty secretive, many people were skeptical of Berhalter's appointment and for good reason because this just stunk of nepotism. And the biggest fuel to that fire was the fact that Berhalter's brother had a pretty high position in the US Soccer Federation. It's pretty suspect that out of anyone in the world they could have chosen, they chose the guy's brother. And of course, it's always going to be speculation, but just a very interesting note. And unfortunately, when it came to what Berhalter had to offer on the pitch, there wasn't really much for US national team fans to get behind. Berhalter played a really regressive, uncreative, and one-dimensional style of football. If you ask him, he would probably describe it as a very attacking and front-footed way of playing football, but it's really not the case. He usually just likes to get it out to the wingers and hoof it up into the middle, and they don't really have a striker to do that. It's incredibly one-dimensional, he's been playing the same way since 2018 without really ever changing much. Oftentimes, he would really rely on his star players to create individual moments of brilliance to essentially save his job. You tired? <laughs> Come on, stop talking together. He would get good results here and there and would even get the better of a rapidly regressing Mexico side on a few occasions. But when it came to silverware, Berhalter didn't really hold up his end of the bargain. He would win the 2021 Copa Oro again against a very poor Mexican side, but he would lose the Copa Oro in 2019, which was actually the US's opportunity to win back-to-back -back trophy. Alas, under Berhalter, we did see the rise of a lot of young, promising players like Christian Pulisic, Wilson McKenney, Tyler Adams, Serginio Des, and Gio Reyna, who would all bring a lot of hope to the US men national team fans, especially because as I mentioned earlier, even to that point in time, those were all players who had a lot of European experience at high level teams. So from a US perspective, these are all guys that could take your team to a whole nother level. But unfortunately for those players, they had to come back to the US and play under a man who could probably coach a varsity high school soccer team to the same effect. But these players, as I mentioned, oftentimes bailed out Burhalter and they'd give the US a good advantage, especially when coming up against better teams. So so up to the point of the 2022 World Cup, Berhalter's job was criticized but relatively safe. Like I said, failed to win one Copa Oro, won the other one, but now it's time to make sure he would qualify for the 2022 World Cup and that is something that he would do. He would be able to lead the US to the World Cup in Qatar, which was a great step forward as it really did feel like they exercised their demons from the last campaign. At the World Cup, the US finally had a chance to show the world how much progress they had made as a footballing country, having not been seen by the mass footballing world world since 2014, this was her opportunity to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best of them. Being drawn in a group with England, Wales, and Iran, this was their moment. And all things considered, at least in the group stage, they didn't do too bad. Berhalter's terrible tactics aside, they would draw against Wales and England, and they did manage to beat Iran to secure a spot in the round of 16. And one side note, the match against England was incredibly boring because it was Gareth Southgate against Greg Berhalter. This was just the one of the worst matches of football to watch, but you had to be there you really did. After the group stage, they would face the Netherlands where their journey would end. At that point, the quality of the Dutch national team was just too much for Greg Berhalter ball. After this tournament and the overall feel of stagnation within the US men's national team, Berhalter would see out the rest of his contract and would leave his post as a coach in December of 2022. And also a big reason for Berhalter's decision to step down was the fact that he got into a pretty big spat with Gio Reyna's parents. See, they brought up an incident that occurred years ago in large part due to the fact that Berhalter kind of got into it with Gio Reyna at the World Cup. He wasn't given Reyna the minutes that he promised him, despite the fact that Reyna clearly was a big part of the US's attacking talent and probably their biggest creative outlet. Gio Reyna's parents took this to offense and just created a clown show within the US Soccer Federation. All of this playing a big part in Berhalter stepping down. From an outside perspective, it was hilarious to watch as a US men's national team fan. Embarrassing. Having laid some great groundwork within the culture of the national team, the Federation really had a chance to pick up a great 
great coach for the upcoming Copa America and also for the preparations of the next World Cup, which means now was the time to really make significant strides in world football. Well, after searching high and wide for a new coach who could implement their vision and fresh ideas into this team, Rohalter's brother would make a boss call and Greg would find himself in the position of head coach once again, being appointed in July of 2023, this time being given the keys until after the 2026 World Cup. This announcement was met with great distaste from the national team fans as it felt that the Federation had just fumbled harder than when the Seahawks didn't run it at the one yard line. They are now going to be forced to watch the national team be dragged through the mud during some of the most important tournaments of the development for the country. So from here, Berhalter's first real test would be Copa America. And I don't want to talk about the Nations League at all really because in all honesty guys, it's really just glorified friendly. I know the media has ran with it and it's treated like a very sophisticated trophy but the Nations League was literally just brought in to partially replace friendlies that happened in the international window. So I don't really care about it and honestly you shouldn't either. But going back to Copa America 2024 for the US national team, I did make a ton of videos about how Copa America went specifically for the CONCACAF teams and also largely the US and Mexico. But long story short, it was an embarrassment. The US managed to win the game where they were massive favorites against Bolivia and then capitulated against Panama where they would lose 2-1 after an abysmal display that showcased how poor Berhalter's tactics are. And it also didn't help the Balogun did his best UFC impression as well. This then left them to play against one of the favorites in Uruguay where in a massive act of cowardly behavior, Berhalter attempted to display to his team the results in another match and shortly after the US would concede a goal, seeing them exit the tournament after the group stage. After this, it would not matter if Berhalter's entire family made up the US Soccer Federation because everyone was calling for his head. Except the players because they were on his side because he was an easy coach to play under and he had his favorites. But regardless of the players, the fans, everyone was calling for Berhalter out. Berhalter would be relieved of his duties and the US national team fans could finally rest knowing that the man who had brought them such shame to their country during a period that could have been filled with prosperity was finally gone. But with Berhalter out the window, it's now a question of who's going to take over. There were rumors of Jurgen Klopp taking over as he seemed infatuated with the US as a country and he had recently left his long tenure at Liverpool. Unfortunately, he very kindly decided to friend zone the national team and thus the search continued. Lots of coaches were rumored such as a lot of MLS bummy coaches, Patrick Vieira, even the former Saudi Arabia manager Renard was rumored to take over and ultimately out of nowhere, Mauricio Pochettino became the front runner to take the mantle and he would be the one who would take the keys to drive the team to the promised land. And when it comes to managers, going from Berhalter to Pochettino is incredibly night and day. As I mentioned earlier, Poch's tactical prowess is something that's going to be a massive breath of fresh air for the national team. Pochettino isn't really a manager who has a whole lot of accolades and that is definitely something that people can and will criticize him for. His last two managerial stints at PSG and Chelsea were relatively lackluster and this is something that many people are going to take into account. And because this was more recent, a lot of people tend to overlook his time with Spurs and what he was able to achieve with that relatively lackluster squad. Although with that being said, Pochettino still possesses the ability to make the most out of his players and specifically his attacking talent. Although he did struggle a bit with Messi, Neymar, and Mbappe at PSG, if we're being honest, that was a very toxic environment for him to walk into and there was only really so much control that he had. However, at Spurs, he would see the likes of Son and Kane become goal scoring machines and in his last moments with Chelsea, he was able to really get a lot out of Cole Palmer to create him into this attacking monster that we're still seeing at this point in time. If he's able to identify the talent that he has at his disposal, such as Gio Reyna, Pulisic, Mulligan, Josh Sargent, Brendan Aronson, there's definitely a lot of potential for Pochettino to cook up something fierce. There is still a main concern of a club manager coming down to manage a national team. We've seen it in the past and it doesn't always work exactly how one would think so because they're two very different worlds. With the club team, managers have the benefits of having nine months to work with to really get their ideas instilled into their players and get them working the way that they need to. But with national teams, coaches really only have two weeks at a time. So national team managers really have to identify the strengths of the team and also the weaknesses and cook up something as quickly as they can with what they have at their disposal. So it's still yet to see how Pochettino is going to do with this shorter time frame. But regardless, having a manager of this quality to take you onto a World Cup cycle is a luxury that the US men's national team cannot and should not take for granted. Because this, if it works out, could be massive for the future of US soccer. Thank you.